Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Last Humans Tech again. Let's go through another phase here in our Security Plus acronym tips kind of discussion. And this isn't an in-depth review. As you know, I like to keep my videos short and sweet. Don't like to waste a lot of time. Let's jump right in here. So in the last video, we discussed the cloud types, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And I just wanted you to know one more is XAAS, which means everything as a service. It's kind of an all-in-one of the three above, just so you know that term, XAAS. So you have different types of clouds. You have a private cloud. This is for your own company. It could be inside your firewall. And it's also operated and controlled by your own company. It is not accessible by anybody else. It is private. It can exist outside of your building, for example, but you would still control it. Now, the public cloud is the most common cloud that almost everybody uses. Businesses operate and host clouds, and such as Amazon, etc., Google, all kinds of companies. And that cloud is situated on the premises of the cloud provider in the cloud provider's building, and it is operated by the cloud provider themselves. Now you can also have a community cloud. This would be a, a cloud that's shared among various businesses or organizations. And this would be possible if a collection of organizations all have the same goals and requirements for a particular cloud. You could then combine into a community cloud to be shared by everybody. Of course, this does have risks in itself also. And the hybrid cloud is the fourth type of cloud. And it's basically just combining any two of the above, usually a private and a public, because community or is already considered public. So two different cloud types, just think about private and public, would be a hybrid cloud. Some of the terms associated with the cloud environment here that we're studying right now, host elasticity. This will allow your resources to grow and shrink as the load requires, making sure you, you stay running smoothly. This typically dynamically can add maybe CPU cores and memory to your machine if it's starting to bog down, and it just keeps it running safe. Now, another similar method, which is also doing that type of thing, would be called cloud bursting. This is when your cloud is just too overloaded and it's, it's starting to bog down it can offload traffic to extra resources also during heavy load. So host elasticity and cloud bursting are sort of the same thing. Then you have sandboxing is another technique on the cloud. This is to keep your apps in restricted little sandbox play area, right? And that means if you have any problems with that application, if it crashes, if it gets a virus, anything, it can't get outside the sandbox to corrupt anything else in the cloud. So it's a way of keeping something isolated, so to speak. Now, the multi-tenancy is cloud hosters putting data from various companies onto the same cloud. There are many risks involved with this, of course. If one organization has a bad app or doesn't have strong enough security, that could filter into your own data and cause problems for yourself, too. So you have to be very careful with security in the multi-tenancy type of cloud environment. And the company, the organization that puts any data on the cloud is legally responsible for all that data and whatever happens to it. The cloud provider is not legally responsible for what you put up on the cloud. If there's any legal issues ever, the lawyers will come to your company, not to the cloud hoster, and say, hey, why do you have this data here? Now we'll talk a little about the virtual hypervisor. And this is the framework, basically, to host virtual machines, to have a, a set of VMware servers, whatever you have it. So the hypervisor is like the controller to control many machines at once. You have the type 1 hypervisor which is just basically the hardware, the bare bones. And it boots before the operating system comes up. It is on the base level, a type one. You can see that this is more efficient because it doesn't have anything else to run. 
It just runs your hypervisor alone. And the type 2 hypervisor is the hosted model. Now this is installed onto an operating system. So you can see it's not going to be as efficient. And because the CPU, all the hardware, is running that operating system at the same time trying to run your hypervisor on top of it. So the type 1 hypervisor could be preferred for efficiency and also ease of use. Now there is a term called snapshots, and that's to take an image of any virtual machine in that hypervisor. If you're doing upgrades, if you're doing backups, you can do what's called a snapshot, and it takes an image of that exact OS as it sits at the time, in case you have to go backwards again. And you have QoS, that's quality of service. This is a protocol, you should remember this one, used for load balancing and prioritizing service. And it's quality of service. It's very common, a common tag in IT talk. So just remember it's associated with load balancing. Now some quick thoughts on database and applications. The most common database design that people know about is SQL, for example, and that is a relation, re, relational database. And what that means is it has a table, it has rows, columns, it's all in relation, sort of in a, in a crisscross, in a table. And it has predefined schemas where you can't customize and put data anywhere you want. It's in a, in a setup design already that you have to use, and you can create attributes and different layers of your rows and columns to create your database. Now this one is susceptible to SQL injection attacks which we may talk about in later videos. The other database design, kind of the opposite end, is called the no SQL design. Go figure that. So it is a dynamic changing database exactly opposite of what we just talked about. And instead of tables, rows, and columns it would have a single document usually XML format. An example of a no SQL database is MongoDB and CouchDB. There are three different model types for a database. You have your one tier, which means the database and application are on the same server. The two tier, database is on one server, application is on a separate server. And the three tier, pretty obvious, you have a middleman, a middle server, which is an interpreting and evaluating all the requests between the database and the application. Could be a security server, making sure that all the inputs are valid before it passes it on to the database. So you have a single tier, double tier, and a triple tier for extra security. Now everybody watching this has probably heard of the SAN, the storage area network. That's a real easy one. And it's just a collection of servers, switches, firewalls, all types of equipment that are connected together to appear as just one server and it requires just as much security as any other server in your entire company and it's usually connected with either high-speed fiber or the more common technique these days is with the iSCSI format. So we have a term called fuzzing. This is what a hacker will do to try and get into a database or to crash an application and fuzzing means typing in different characters than the application expects. Now this could be quantity, it could be more characters than you're supposed to put in for that answer to the application, and it could even be different characters and strange characters that the application does not expect, and what they're trying to do is get the application to crash, and they might gain some info from that, watching some error messages, might even be able to get into the application that way. So fuzzing, entering unexpected data into an application. That's a hacking method. Now you have OWASP, just a little acronym you should know. Open Web Application Security Project. And they provide standards worldwide for security best coding practices. And along with that, you also have the CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. And this also handles standards for secure co coding in particular, Java, Perl, C, and C++. And the best practices or 
not to provide too much detailed error information because that could give the hacker some hints about how to get into your system. Let's stop here and I'll restart in a minute. All right, we're back. Let's talk about baselining. So that's basically anytime you're going to make a change to an application, you want to do a baseline and check all its settings and load and make sure that you know how it's reacting before you put on that patch. And then you can do another evaluation of performance and compare it to that baseline. Um, we've talked about that maybe in previous Security Plus videos, maybe not but that's for any type of security project. You do your baseline to know where you stand and then you know when something is unusual or different because you see some variations in that. And the Security Plus is going to talk about some patches and stuff like that. You have your hot fix. This is easy stuff for most of us. A hot fix is an immediate urgent patch for a big security issue. A regular patch is non-urgent. Just possibly provide some functionality, maybe a small fix. A service pack is a cumulative assortment of hotfixes, patches, anything in a large scale to for an entire operating system. We've all installed Windows service packs in our day. Now Microsoft file permissions, you have five types. Full control includes read, execute, write, and to reassign permissions. That's everything. Then you have modify, read and write, and you can delete read and execute because not all files you need to write. It could be a command and you want that person to be able to open it, read it, and execute it. So that's when no write permission is needed. You could use the read and execute. Then you have your read and your write, which are pretty obvious, read only, write only. And you'll see the term ACL a lot, access control list, and that could allow either users or hosts or anything at all you want in there to allow access in or out of that network and determine what can come in and what cannot. And you would have something called a whitelist, which is items that are allowed to come into your network, and a blacklist for IPs or users that you do not want to come into your network. You'd put them on your blacklist. Now, network footprinting is a method to gather info about your own network in order to find ways that it could be hacked into. You're looking for vulnerabilities. You are doing network footprinting, kind of looking at your whole network layout, determining where can someone come in and attack this. An acronym that's good to know is DNSSEC. That's Domain Name System Security Extensions. And what this does is it's a company. It's, um, it adds security to DNS, handles digital certificates, and it was created by the IETF the Internet Engineering Task Force. Next, we're almost done here. Hang in there. Talk about backups real quick. I probably talked about this in the Server Plus certification, maybe a video or two. This is pretty basic stuff at this point if you're at this level of certifications. Your full backup is, of course, very time consuming and intensive. It's a full backup. You don't want to do that every day. You have your differential backup. Your differential backup, after you're full, it will record all the new data since that full backup every day, not just the new data. So say you make a full backup Sunday, differential backup Monday will backup just the new stuff since Sunday, and then the differential backup on Tuesday will backup all the new stuff from Monday and Tuesday, everything that changed from the first first backup. So the differential backup does get larger each day. It's not just doing new pieces, right? And the advantage of a differential backup is you're only going to have two backups to restore whenever you do need to restore your image. You would do your full backup and whatever your very latest differential backup is because it got everything, remember? Then you have your incremental backup. This is the opposite. It just records the new data each day. So the advantage of incremental backup is that it can be done very quickly, day to day, because it's only backing up new stuff on a day to day basis since the day before. Now, the disadvantage to incremental backup is when you need to do a restore, you got to restore all those days, the full, each new data each day, and you're dealing with six or eight different backups, and that just consumes time, different tapes, swapping, all kinds of stuff like that. So every backup has its own pros and cons. Now, a newer backup type is the hierarchical storage management, 
which is a continuous online backup with basically infinite disk. So it's an easier method to use. You'll see it more often. I believe Apple might be using that right now. And that's a, a good way to back up and make it easier to restore. Now we'll go into the RAID just a little bit. Again, we've talked about the RAID in the Server Plus video, I think. The RAID 0, Stripe, RAID 1, Mirror, that's easy stuff. The RAID 3 is a Stripe with a dedicated parity disk. It requires three or more disks. You can lose one disk on RAID 3 and you're going to be fine. RAID 5 is a Stripe with distributed parity across disks instead of dedicated on one disk. Again, it, you have to use three or more disks and you can lose one disk and still be okay. Now the RAID 6 is pretty uncommon. You probably won't get a question on it, but it's a stripe with dual distributed parity. So all it means is it needs four or more disks rather than three with the one before it. And you can lose two disks instead of one with RAID 6. So although it will require more disks, it's also a little bit safer than RAID 5. Now RAID 1 plus 0 and RAID 0 plus 1. The way to remember these, do not put the words in the order that the numbers go. It's opposite of that. And you, you might get a question, what is a stripe of mirrors? What raid level? What raid level is a mirror of the stripes? And what you see here, let's just say, see, one is mirror, zero is stripes. You'd say mirror stripe, but it's opposite, stripe mirror. So that's the little trick you got to remember there. When they're talking about stripes of mirrors and mirror of stripes, reverse the RAID numbers as seen in these words to get your RAID 1 plus 0 or 0 plus 1. We're almost done here, guys. DLP, data loss prevention systems. These are very important. They run on the network, and they monitor content, data, and files. And they can detect if any files are deleted or removed. They can detect if a critical system file is edited. It's basically to make sure no one's hacking your network. And one common version of this is called MyDLP. You can also monitor who is touching your data, who's looking at it. So it's, it's basically a security device, a DLP, data loss prevention system. Excuse me. Now the TPM is a trusted platform module. It's found usually in the BIOS level of a PC or a server. It can store crypt cryptography keys, password certificates and it's a it's a form of encryption that the server can use but it's on BIOS level low low level for the disks and it can be combined with Microsoft's BitLocker which is on the Windows server and some of the professional versions of Windows my Windows here does not have BitLocker um, installed it, it's a it's a home version that I have but remember, BitLocker is also a disk encryption technology that the higher-end Windows operating systems can use. And finally, you have HSM, Hardware Security Module. And this is a crypto processor used to enhance security. And it's commonly combined with PKI. That's a very important keyword that you'll hear a lot, public key infrastructure. It's the whole exchanging of keys and encryption. And you can combine that hardware security module with the public key encryption for extra extra security there and the HSM modules usually come in a PCI card that's how you would add it to your server so that's it for now it's a lot of info again to take in and I'll keep making these videos here with my next one after I do a little more studying we're getting closer to passing this test and I hope you learned a few things here today watching Last Humans Tech thanks guys see you next time